Okay, hello everyone. My name's Arthur Falls. I'm from uh, I'm director of communications at Definity. You may know me from such podcasts as Beyond Bitcoin, The Ether Review, and The Third Web, which are all on the same feed. So it's really just one long podcast that has changed with uh, with the blockchain space itself. Um, I'm going to be presenting Definity today. Uh, I just presented it moments ago to the coin, um, uh, what was it called, coin, coin scrum guys. And uh, what I realized was that it's actually much better as an interactive presentation because there's so much to cover and just launching into an explanation um, myself, which is this is a subject I've been, I've been into Definity for like two years, and it's phenomenally intricate. And, um, and it's really easy to, uh, it's really easy to just, go on these, these tangents, but there's, huge, there's a ton of background and it's worth making sure that we're all on the same page as we proceed. Um, so, you know, it's, this is a slightly rough presentation. Only the second time I've ever presented Definity, um, but I'll make up with it uh, with affability and uh, cricket. Um, so, we all know this idea of the world computer, right? It was kind of coined by, um, it was coined by the, I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, don't need to know about what's going on on the uh, on Telegram. Oh, that was someone from the UK. Does anyone know Secure Scuttlebutt? Has anyone heard of Secure Scuttlebutt? Is that yeah, um, super awesome? But we don't need notifications from them either or Slack. Um, Dominic from Secure Scuttlebutt. Dominic Tars, like a really great friend of Definity, and um, Definity's uh, provided them with a, uh, a grant. Um, just some trivia there. Um, so. Definity aims to be a world computer, and it aims to actually respond to what is a pretty clear uh, design trajectory in uh, application architecture. Um, so this application architecture, I think, personifies or personifies, uh, epitomizes cloud 3.0, right? Bit of a bit of buzz phraseology there. Uh, and I really want to talk quite a bit about cloud 3.0. Uh, then I want to dive straight into the nuts and bolts of Definity's uh, consensus and, and what makes it such a powerful, super uh, fast uh, world computer. So we get uh, finality in uh, seven seconds. Um, in fact, in our test net, we're getting it in, uh, in one second. So it's, it's phenomenally powerful, but, um, but we're gonna down tune that when we, when, we make it, uh, when we make it live, just so that we're not putting the network under too much stress. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to dive straight into the, the nuts and bolts. So it'll be um, super technical, because why not? Um, so where does this number three come from, right? This web three, uh, cloud three, all this stuff. And really, it's this like, you know, say what you see. There was this clear epoch uh, of the internet from the 80s and the 90s, where everything was protocol driven, TCP, IP. and um, and that kind of was the, the dream of the web was that we could build things on TCP IP and those would be these, these products or these, uh, these websites, as they were known at the time, uh, would be available to everyone. And what ultimately happened and, and came out of the, two, the, uh, the dot com bubble was that people realized there was a lot here. This was an incredible opportunity to sell products to consumers and it led to a proliferation of services that were really took um, TCP IP and packaged it in a way with other services that, uh, that could turn it into a business to business product. And eventually this turned into things like Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Ads, Facebook Ads, uh, eBay, PayPal, and this created a, what, you know, the, the Web 2.0, which was really a, an internet dominated by business to business products and, um, and it was you know playing ball with the, the builders of these products it gave you so much competitive advantage that you didn't stand a chance if you didn't build your businesses on top of these other businesses and eventually that became an oligopoly um, and, and so that you know it's, it's the absolute opposite of what was hoped for the internet the dream of the internet or the dream of the web um, and so this 3.0 idea, Web 3 or Cloud 3, really is a dream for the good old days. A protocol that will compete with 
the platforms of today. A protocol that provides the services of PayPal, which we can easily imagine in the form of Bitcoin or, uh, or some other, you know, probably some other super fast uh, online payment system. Uh, or, uh, or, you know, Amazon in the form of um, uh, Definity or, or some other high performance uh, compute engine. Definity is not a high performance, a lot of people think Definity is a high performance um, co computation service that's, that's decentralized. But in actual fact, it's really a, uh, a, a, a sufficiently performant world computer that is better suited for uh, business logic. So what's wrong with today's IT? Well, uh, if you, you know, want to rely on Oracle, you've got Oracle. If you choose to rely on uh, Amazon Web Services, you're stuck with Amazon Web Services. Unless you want to pay this, uh, this tremendous uh, cost of migrating, you're locked in. Um, you've got interversion compatibility problems with software. So if you, design one if you design a piece of software and change the version, then often you find that, these, uh, that the, the work that's been done or the files that have been created, the content that's been created with an older piece of software is not compatible with a newer piece of software. I recently had to buy a new license of OmniGraffle for just the new update. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, there's also inter-platform problems. So communicating across platforms requires some degree of boilerplate. Um, you've got, uh, well, that's, there's your compatibility issues. Um, you've also got the labor intensiveness of supporting on, uh, the labor intensiveness of supporting your, uh, your cloud infrastructure or your, um, your IT infrastructure, which inevitably goes down at times due to complexities and human error and uh, data keeps getting stolen. Uh, that's, you know, is, <laughs> needs, no, uh, needs no elaboration. The IT experience should be 0% downtime. This stuff should just work. Uh, your IT should run itself. You shouldn't need, this is a machine. It should go, you know. I mean, think of tractors. You know, I, I look at like some of these old, um, some of these old tractors growing up in a, a good old ag agricultural uh, background. Um, you know, there are 50-year-old Massey Ferguson's and uh, they trundle along. Um, that's what our, t our IT should be like. Um, it should not be a point of business vulnerability. You shouldn't be getting, having data stolen, and um, you, you shouldn't have to worry about these interversion compatibility issues. There should be just one version. Um, and of course, it should be super secure. Um, the other thing about versions, actually, one more word on versions. If you think about it, when we develop software, and we come up with these updates, and it's like, well, we came up with an update, it's great. We actually rely on the, uh, the user to participate in the updating process. The user has to download an update. It's not like suddenly the software just gets better across the board. We actually require the user to do something. And I mean, I keep getting this thing saying, update your, your laptop, but I just don't have time, right? It's this annoying, it's gonna, I've got to plug it in, I'm not gonna be able to use it for an hour. I mean, all this stuff is weird uh, friction that, that really shouldn't exist, uh, and we really shouldn't have to deal with. So the structure of what I'm gonna call cloud three, and we don't have to, this, this may not be the, cannot, the ultimate usage of the term, but I'm just gonna, just gonna run with this idea, is that, your application on your phone is going to point, or, or, your, or your computer, is going to point to a location in a data center where a piece of software is. You're going to download the user interface, and, uh, and through that user interface and any other necessary stuff that you need for, for, for running a local application, and then that application's design is going to be optimized around having some remote computation and a lot of remote storage and some local computation, but a lot less, obviously, and, uh, and a lot less local storage. Is this, is this making sense to people? Do, do we have any questions so far? I just, is everyone kind of, yep? So, is it a bit like a, cross, uh, a combination of storage and column? So this is not any, this is not definity. I'm just describing the reality of, uh, of the future of application architecture. So this is just, this is the way it's inevitably going. If you think about it, we're, we're restricted by this form factor. You know, we're restricted by the phone form factor. Um, but you're not restricted by a data center form factor. You know, I mean, that's, the thing's pretty big. It doesn't have to fit in your pocket. 
and uh, the only real restriction is the bandwidth. And so inevitably there is going to be, software design is going to um, take advantage of this, um, take advantage of increasing bandwidth. Things like, um, like 4G, which is phenomenal. I mean, I use my phone instead of Wi-Fi because it's more reliable. Um, so you know, bandwidth is pretty much solved. And the reason that we know this is happening is that in 2017, I believe it was in August, um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and the Mozilla Foundation finalized the specification for WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is a virtual machine that runs in the browser, again, Safari, um, Chrome, um, Internet Explorer, if anyone remembers Internet Explorer, and, uh, and Firefox, and uh, it allows you to run rich, uh, rich programs that are written in a number of languages. That could be Haskell, it could be Go, it could be Java, Script, it could be um, whatever other programming languages, um, uh, Python. Um, and, and, so, and so the idea is that this is signaling that we can expect to see um, software, uh, rich software written with, uh, and designed to be run inside the browser rather than this, uh, like an application that is predominantly on your computer. Um, it just doesn't, you know, it just, it doesn't signal the, that that is a, a future, um, a future design pattern. And the other thing is, um, it, it indicates that there's going to be full cross compatibility. So think about if you had your, all of your applications predominantly stored on data centers or, or remotely, right? Let's start using the term remotely because ultimately I, I'm going to start talking about storing your, uh, your applications on Definity. So what if instead you just had your applications on a data center? Then it means that you could just log into any old computer and presumably have a secure connection to, this, uh, to your applications and, um, and be able to uh, interact with them regardless of the actual platform that you're using, regardless of whether you choose to use uh, Apple or Windows or what have you, or, um, or Android or iOS. So Definity's vision is to take this model that seems to be emerging, this, this kind of the next generation of application design, and build a blockchain computer that is, that, that is developed with this in mind. So rather than having your application in uh, a data center somewhere, you have it loaded into the Definity uh, world computer, which is very similar to Ethereum. It's very similar to Ethereum, and the dream or the ideal is to use the um, eWASM transpiler to transpile um, uh, Ethereum contracts into um, WebAssembly so that they can run in, uh, in the Definity environment. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole idea is that Definity will offer a diversity, a diversified product, something that is a protocol that can solve all of the problems that, um, that we currently face with our uh, IT architectures. But rather than super high performance, we have super security, ultra, ultra reliability, and, uh, and zero downtime. Ah, which is in this slide. Um, so, comparing these two different futures, we can go with what we have right now, which is oligopolistic, it's complex, um, it has human-based security, uh, it only has 99.9% .9 uptime, which is great until S3 goes down, uh, and you have to pay for DevOps, which means, I, which means a lot of stuff. It doesn't just mean having to pay people to maintain your, uh, your, your IT infrastructure, it means having to pay HR to find people to pay, you know, to deal with your IT infrastructure. It means payroll. It means all of these things. It means supporting a workforce. Whereas we should have sufficiently, is that actually asking me to update some <laughs> software? You know, like, I mean, and now of all times, like this is actually, a, a, you know, this is not really acceptable behavior of, uh, of, you know, it's not like a Massey Ferguson that's 50 years old and you know if you just jam that thing into gear, it'll go um, for a while. Um, try to deny. Anyway, so what we need is something decentralized, and obviously there's a, there's a censorship concern here. We want something monolithic, so one, uh, one place where everything is stored. We want perfect security because we've got it with blockchain. I mean, so why not, you know, it gets to go on the slide. 100% uptime and uh, self-maintaining. So that is the, 
th these are the benefits that we can get from existing uh, world computer technology. So, um, so this gives us an opportunity to build something that is meaningfully different from what is being provided by the, um, the existing uh, powers that be. So how does it work? Well, let's get into it. Threshold signatures. Does anyone, uh, how many people are confident in their understanding of um, asymmetric key cryptography or public-private key cryptography? All right, I see a couple of hands down the back. You'll be really, you're, you're in good stead to understand this material. <laughs> so the idea of public-private key cryptography is that you have one key that encrypts or signs. We're talking about signing specifically here, so um, just think signing. And you have another key that verifies signatures. And um, what we're going to, what we want to do <laughs> with, um, what we want to do with, uh, our cryptography is be able to make it so anyone can verify a signature, but only one person or one group can actually create a signature. And this is like a digital signature. So say you're, this is, this is how, um, this is how uh, Bitcoin um, signs transactions, right, that are then ultimately validated because one person has a private key and they sign a transaction that makes an update to the Bitcoin blockchain that says I moved Bitcoin somewhere else and there, everyone can use their public key, which is their Bitcoin address, to verify that that signature was, that that, uh, that movement is in fact legitimate. With a threshold signature, it's a little bit more complicated. With a threshold signature, we use something called the distributed key generation algorithm to generate keys on a whole bunch of computers that are all components of a single key. So it's like, you can't, produce a, uh, you can't produce a complete signature that's verifiable with a public key with just one of those pieces of a private key. You need to have a certain, a majority of them. And, um, and so that is kind of the, the idea of threshold signatures. So we generate these signatures across a whole bunch of computers. Those signatures sign a piece of data and then they can distribute their pieces of the signature that then can be assembled to create the, uh, the final complete signature. But the beauty of threshold cryptography is that you don't need all of the pieces, you just need a certain portion of them. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Definity's implementation of threshold cryptography, we only wanna have a slim majority or a majority, any majority is fine. Um, so, that you'll notice this is a slight departure from the, uh, the previous graphics. I just gave this presentation and it didn't really make, I realized I was missing this exact slide. So the way that the Definity Network works is that we have a whole bunch of miners validating transactions, but we only have a small, uh, a certain set of those miners um, adding blocks to the blockchain at any one time or notarizing a block. As, uh, as a canonical version of events. This is, um, but I realize I'm just starting to get into this. Is everyone comfortable with threshold signatures? Clear as mud? Um, does that mean comfortable? So we've got, we got one over here. Um, <laughs> two? We've got two people. I mean, this is all right. It's, 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 better, than, it's, it's better than nothing. And, uh, and you know. It's the majority. Yeah, right. Well, it's not quite the majority, is it? Um, it's not quite a complete. It's not quite a, com a complete signature. Um, it's only two. We need at least, you know, that half of the room. There's 40 people here, so 21, right, to create a complete signature that would be verifiable by the public key. Um, so the way that um, now we're really diving into it. So the way that Definity works is we run everything based on the fact that we've found a way to create randomness in a decentralized fashion. And so far as I'm aware, no one else has. This is the first time in history that anyone's managed to do this. I could be wrong, but uh, I, you know, I haven't encountered a solution um, as elegant as a Definity's solution, which is called Threshold Relay, as of yet. And it's at the core of what powers the Definity world computer. So we start off the whole system with a piece of arbitrary data. It could be the uh, roll of a dice, it could be someone's mother's maiden name, it could be a headline in a newspaper. We use, thresh, uh, a, uh, we use that to randomly select 
a subset of the minor base of Definity, the, the validator base. And that subset is called our notarization committee. That notarization committee generates a threshold key pair and then uses that uh, threshold key pair to sign the original piece of arbitrary data that was used as randomness. That piece, the output of that, that signature, is pseudo-random. It's totally, it's just a jumble of, uh, of, of numbers and, and hex code, right? And that is then used to select the next committee. So it's no longer the same committee. It's a completely separate one, completely randomly selected from the minor base or the validator base of the Definity network. That network then generates some, uh, generates a public-private key pair or a, uh, a threshold key pair and signs that randomness, signs that the previous signature that we, was used to select them and outputs yet another signature that is effectively random. And there's absolutely no way that anyone could have predicted what it was going to be from any other, any of the, uh, the public information prior. And there's also no way that anyone could have influenced who these, uh, wh which were the actual nodes that got to participate in the, uh, in the creation of that signature. Um, so in Definity, there's no ball tampering. It's a cricket joke. <laughs> yeah, I just told you I'd do one. Um, and so, uh, so what we have is verifiable, deterministic, uh, unmanipulatable, and um, there's one more, unpredictable randomness, right? Technically pseudo-randomness, but, um, but it's fully unpredictable and no one can mess with it. So we can use it as a way to create this totally uncheatable system. While these, while these nodes are creating randomness, they can also just do one other thing, sign blocks. Sign Bitcoin blocks, or definity blocks, but uh, blocks of state transitions. And um, we're used to Bitcoin where you have this, uh, this dynamic leader base, but in, uh, in, or this dynamic validator base. But in definity, because definity is proof of stake, and each definity node that is participating as a miner in the network had to place a place stake, a place of uh, uh, a, uh, a bond, a security deposit. Uh, they had to basically register that they had a security deposit uh, that belonged to them. Because of that, we know who's going to be in the network at any one time. And that's how we, uh, we, so we can be sure that we can keep selecting these um, reliably, these participants to run the, uh, the random beacon, to run threshold relay. We can also use them to sign blocks. And they're always random. And in Definity, we have 400 of these operating at any one time. And those, that, that group of 400 can sign a block and distribute this, or can each, uh, through using a gossip protocol, uh, sign uh, each, uh, each of the member of the notar notarization committee signs uh, a block with their piece of the private key and then gossips it onward. And so eventually we assemble a, a whole bunch of, uh, of signature shares that can be used to assemble into a complete signature. It's super simple, and it just all happens at the same time as the, uh, as the randomness is generated. Um, it's, uh, it's phenomenally elegant. The problem is, it's very easy for two different blocks to be produced, two competing blocks to be produced by the system. So we need a way to choose which block is going to win, which block is going to get added to the blockchain. And because we have randomness, and because all of the, uh, all of the nodes, all of the, uh, the validators, the miners in the system, have all had to pay, uh, post a security deposit, and they've all had to register as miners inside the protocol, we can just apply randomness to a ranking algorithm to just give them all a rank, at, totally arbitrarily, totally at random, and then just choose a winner, basically by tossing a coin that is verifiable, unmanipulatable, uh, deterministic, and, uh, and unpredictable. And so here's uh, our fearless leader, Dom, um, explaining this. This is an old demo. Um, you can see 
the, uh, the network at work. The, these green dots are our, our, uh, our notarization committee. This big green dot is the, uh, the node that created the block that got added to the blockchain. And as you can see, this is running at an average of half a second for a block time. And we only need two blocks to achieve total finality. Now we're gonna down tune this for the production network, but already this is, this is phenomenal. It's totally out of this world. It's basically perfect. Um, you, just, you just can't possibly do any better than that. It's basically network traversal uh, in order to, um, to create this, uh, this synchronous and um, canonical version of events, uh, a single objective global history. And, um, and we have, it's a pity, I'm, I'm using this, I had a, a different demo that was from our current internal testnet, which is, which is internal, it's not, it's not external facing. We're still trying to plug WebAssembly, which is the, um, the, uh, uh, the in-browser execution engine that is being developed by Microsoft, Google, um, the Mozilla Foundation and Apple, into this blockchain, but we're very, very close, uh, and it should be public in a few weeks with any luck. Um, but Threshold Relay and this system is live internally right now in a production testnet, so it's not hard enough for, uh, for, for release, but we effectively have a release candidate internally right now. So in review, we're entering a new age of software architecture. Uh, the cloud will be at the heart of application design. I mean, it's, this is really, really clear. So anything that anyone does right now needs to be, at an infrastructure level, needs to take this into consideration. Uh, Definity can offer more secure and often less expensive alternative to large enterprise cloud providers. And the reason it's more secure is that it has this perfect cryptographic security. And the reason why it's often less expensive is that we don't get hacked, we, or Definity doesn't get hacked, there's really no we. Uh, there's no need for maintenance, there's no need for DevOps, there's no need for HR for your DevOps. Um, and at the heart of Definity uh, is WebAssembly as an execution environment, uh, blockchain as a database uh, infrastructure, and Threshold Relay, which is our randomness generation and uh, at the core of our consensus mechanism. And uh, that's Definity in a nutshell. So I've left a ton out um, because this to me is what's the most interesting, right? There's, we've, got, we've got governance, we've got all these other like little bells and whistles, we've got really a, a really strong focus on networking. Um, but. Um, but yeah, that's the, uh, that's the nuts and bolts. Well, so, uh, any questions? How would you define uh, your project to be different from your competitors? What do you have that your competitors Actually, this is a great question, and this is a personal answer. It's probably not an answer. This is like why I chose Definity, and it's that I'm looking for, and have been looking for about five years for design, um, for kind of design patterns or, or um, kind of, design choices that will persist. Obviously blockchain is one of them. I mean, look how many times we've seen it redeployed. This, uh, this Merkleized data structure with the, uh, the state root stored in a block header chain, right? That's a blockchain, everyone's using it. So we can assume that that's gonna be part of the future. So what else will be part of the future? And uh, WebAssembly seems to be a shelling point. You know, we can assume that's a shelling point because we have so much external industry um, so much external industry signaling around this new way of doing things. Uh, so I'd say WebAssembly is another one. And, uh, but, and lots of people are using these two things, right? Uh, you know, if, if everyone kind of knows that WebAssembly is the future, and lots of people know blockchain is the future. No one has threshold relay. No one has randomness. And so any successful solution, in my view, will use, um, Threshold Relay, because it seems like it's the best and most advanced um, randomness, uh, you know, randomness producing system. Uh, WebAssembly and blockchain. And uh, it, when you combine these things, you get a really great developer experience, and you also get uh, super fast block times and ultra fast finality. So that would be, that's how I describe our differentiation. We're not like Gollum in, or Truebit. 
So we're very similar to Ethereum, just we rely on, a, on this, we have this system of, for generating uh, really strong randomness. So it will happen massively replicated across every single um, across every single node that is participating in a given shard. So what I described is, I mean, essentially you have the um, you're running the WebAssembly virtual machine on the client, um, and so every single um, every single client is running that machine that uh, virtual machine, and every single client has to execute the code. If you have a million nodes, which is what uh, Definity aims to scale to. That's more redundancy than anyone really needs. The beauty of this, and I haven't included it in this presentation, is that we can very easily use the source of randomness, threshold relay, to power ultra-thin shards that might go down to as low as 10, uh, 10 replica you know, replications, 10 replicas. So you, know, you can imagine how great that would be instead of having to run an Ethereum contract or, uh, or say you know, some business application on um, every single node, 11,000 nodes, that's really expensive. When we can do it on a much, much smaller number of nodes because we can, use, we can randomly select which nodes are actually doing the, uh, the computation. So, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's how we, uh, how, you know, that's where the, uh, where the computation's taking place, but we can, we can shard this really effectively. So it's, it's a different runtime environment. Same execution engine as we're going to see um, application development move to. Um, it'll be the same execution engine, where, whether it's a decentralized world computer based on a blockchain um, database or, a, uh, or something that runs in the traditional cloud. Same execution infrastructure or same execution environment, but a totally different runtime environment. Um, so there's a point at which it's not, you know, there's, there, these are different environments. It's not just going to be like you can port stuff over to Definity that run and have it run in exactly the same way. It's going to have to be optimized for a different runtime environment. And I'd also say that, like, we talk about Cloud 3.0, um, and it is a really useful buzz phrase. I think there are two different perspectives on it. I think there inevitably is a next generation of cloud that the uh, legacy world anticipates, and they anticipate it as being their own and having most of, the, um, most of the storage and computation take place in data centers. Obviously, like massive incentive, massive financial incentive for this to happen uh, at Google and at Amazon, right? So they love this. This is like, all, they're, they're all about this. But, um, but then we have our version of the future in which this takes place in a decentralized environment with commodity hardware, not, um, not some uh, you know, proprietary Amazon or Google data center. Hey man, thanks a lot. Right, I'm doing nice, it's all good. <laughs> okay, just uh, how, how long do you think until that transition you described from two and those two visions of three are we gonna be fighting it out or happening? Is this so the question is, how long until we see this course of events take place? I suppose, like, things we're doing every day now in the cloud, too, when is it, you know, how, when we see it? Oh, you know, I don't know, man, like, yeah. 10 years? It'll yeah. happen yeah. really so gradually? Like five, 10 years. Yeah. And, um, and not only that, but the real power of Definity is that 
it gives you this ultra robust platform, right? Vastly more robust. Like this is a true differentiator. It's vastly more robust than anything that a centralized provider can offer you. So that's where that's our advantage, right? And there's another advantage too, because if you have everything running on the same virtual computer in the same virtual environment, you have far better interoperation of applications. Um, so it becomes like innovation, essentially. Yeah, fully. It's yeah. Yeah, supplying the, the, the yeah. of that basic that's to what's needed, basically. Yeah, it really is. It's like this is what we need, you know? Sorry, down the back, I keep seeing you get missed. <laughs> hey, so uh, when, when you asked before, does anyone know a little bit about uh, asymmetric um, key encryption? Uh, I think, well, kind of, yeah. I wrote my dissertation on cracking RSA 124 and contributed a lot to RSA 2048. Um, one thing I learned from that process is um, there's, there's no such thing as unhackable. Only uncrackable right now. Yeah. So uh, when RSA 1024 was invented, you know, they never, they never once intended that that would ever be cracked. Um, but also as well in the blockchain space, it's such an innovative, and fascinating space. Uh, I was speaking at Blockchain Live about six months ago, and I find in this space it's very difficult to say we are the only people that do. I saw another speaker at the blockchain line who said, we are the only people who do identity on blockchain. And the next speaker after him was doing identity on blockchain. <laughs> um, so yeah, this will be good for, yeah, for that, just to mention that. And two, how many active nodes do you have? Well, this is uh, where this is like an internal testnet. So, I mean, the one that, that one that I just showed, that, had, that was 500 nodes, um, which is bloody awesome. Like, that's crazy. Um, the internal test net that I'd like to show, it only had 40 running on it. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, the idea is this is supposed to be able to scale up to a million nodes. And uh, it doesn't, it seems pretty robust uh, at this stage. You know, I mean, if we got the old one to get up to 500, the, uh, the new test net will be phenomenally highly performant and phenomenally distributed. And speaking to the, uh, the question of were the only ones, right? I, you know, I think that when people realize that threshold relay is an inevitable design pattern, um, I don't think we will be the only one. I think it'll turn into a, a race. And, the, um, and with regards to unhackable right now or uncrackable right now, we have built in governance because you're absolutely right. Um, things do get hacked and cracked and we do need to prepare for that and we are going to have to change the protocol. And we don't, want to f we don't want this like horrific fork culture that goes on and then you have people incentivized to pump one fork and because of the, um, the exchange architecture or the, the exchange topology of the crypto space, you don't have a single pooled order book. So you get this ultra, vo you know, this tremendous volatility in which the, uh, the combined value of, of the two forks is greater than the old, um, you know, total value of the monetary base and so, People are then like scamming people and stuff like with um, uh, Ethereum Classic, right? The whole thing's a total scam. Just, you know, it's just you're using the plausibility structure of old Ethereum to pump up something for people who don't understand that like really at the end of the day it just, you know, it doesn't have the network effects. Bitcoin Cash is the original Bitcoin. The other one's the fork. Any other Yeah. Hi there. Um, that's a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick five questions to you. I think one of them has actually been already answered by Jeff over there, which is Do you have any competition? Is it zero competition or are you going to create? Uh, you know, I do think there's real competition, man. There are some good teams out there. Um, I'm not going to say. Pardon? I'll go around. Uh, no. Uh, no, I don't think that's um, real competition. Okay, so second quick question. Um, if, for instance, your wallet gets compromised, is there a way or mechanism to reverse a transaction if you get hacked? Because if you're on Bitcoin or yes. any other uh, yes, blockchain, there is. Yeah. if you get hacked, you lose your coins, you lose your, your entire wealth. Is there a way, like a master key or some mechanism which can actually say, hey, you've been compromised, we can actually undo that so you're protected? 
Yes, there is, uh, and that is our uh, governance system that I haven't talked about at all, and I, it's just too big a subject to like go into in any complete form. Um, it has its limitations, but it can roll back certain problems. The idea is it's supposed to be able to revert state, but it can probably only revert global state. So it's you know probably not going to be able to save. Um, it's probably not going to be able to save like if a bunch of people get hacked and it goes you know um, it's, it might be it might be tricky. Um, but it'll also uh, to recover funds with. But it can probably unfreeze locked funds. That might not be too difficult. Uh, it can probably. Well, it can definitely freeze code or programs that we don't want running by just censoring transactions that go to them by automatically flagging them as, um, as, uh, you know, as invalid, which will tick off the, the purists. But the beauty is, I mean, there's, uh, there's a strong incentive to create multiple impl uh, implementations of Definity, even with the same uh, stakeholder base that have different rules to serve different uh, markets. So. There's all sorts of different, um, there's all sorts of opportunities to provide every single thing that you, you want to provide, uh, given you have a robust and, and really strong governance system. And we do have that. Um, it's not fully designed yet, right? Um, but, but yeah, that's kind of a subject for another talk. The answer is yes. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to, to right now. Um, will you be using other technologies such as Gossip Protocol as well as blockchain, or are you going to stick to primarily blockchain? Um, we'll see. You know, I mean, threshold, you know, threshold relay can be used to provide randomness to any to enhance any protocol or any piece of technology that's out there. And um, if we can produce a uh, a proof of uh, of or you know of of state that is validatable and and is acceptable to smart contracts in the network. I mean, we can, uh, or you know, to users of the network, then we can just plug it in as if it were a shard. Um, we can plug just about anything in. So, yeah. So, short answer again, yes. Okay, and last, last question, quick fire question: How many master nodes are you going to have, or will you have master nodes? Well, no. It's a heterogeneous network. So, uh, the notarization committee is randomly selected from the. Uh, the, the minor base or the so yeah, proof of stake. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't like the term proof of stake because it makes me think that we're waiting, uh, we're waiting the canonical version of events based on the the quantity of uh, value that has been staked, right, or put up as a security deposit. I prefer the, the phrase bonded validator because we randomly select, so all nodes are equal in terms of their ability to. Uh, to validate and participate in the network, regardless of the amount of stake that they put up. So I'm not saying that other protocols are, are different that are proof of stake. I'm just saying that there's a terminological issue there. Okay. Um, I'm very impressed. Thank you very much indeed. I'll give it to someone else. Thank you. Time for one last question. That might be it. So let's give it up for Arthur. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, then grab the last.